All right, so let's take a look at the precept two. Uh, we're going to talk about recurrence relations. Let me get my pen going here. Um, and then we're going to talk about the selection, insertion, sort, counting, iterators, and amortized analysis. Uh, so we, to start with, uh, we asked to describe the complexity of selection sort uh, using some sort of a recurrence relation. What does that mean? Um, so you can think of complex uh, selection sort as a divide and conquer algorithm. Let's think like this. The whole idea of selection sort is to, the first step is to find the minimum and bring the minimum of the array to this place here. So this would be the minimum of the entire array. Now let's think about this. Now to find that minimum, you will have to do n minus one comparisons to find that minimum. Once you find that minimum, then you only have to worry about this part of the array, which is n minus one. So you can think about the selection sort as a divide and conquer algorithm. So if you think that the cost to selection sort the entire array is Tn, and therefore I can use the same notation to describe the cost to selection sort the n minus one array, n minus one array is Tm n minus one. So what I need to do is to describe the relation between T of n and T of n minus one as a, some sort of a formula. So how do I think about this? So let's suppose that someone, uh, out, someone gives me Tn minus one. That means someone tells me I know how to selection sort an array of size n minus one. I'll say fine, that's gonna cost you T of n minus one. Then all I need to do is to find the minimum of my array and separate that minimum from the work that the other person has to do. So once this is done, I can completely forget about that part of the array. So in other words, the relation between T of n and T of n minus one is that T of n is going to be equal to the cost to do the find the minimum. So this is the cost to find the minimum. And then once you do that, then it's the cost to sort selection, sort the other side of it. So we can describe this relationship of uh, selection sort using an, a formula like this. So it's a good example of divide and conquer. Not all algorithms can be described this way, but there are certain things like linear search, binary search, can be described in this way. So, so the second part, so this is our answer to the first part. The second part is to solve this recurrence relation. Once you have a relation like this, we want to know what Tn means. What's the closed formula for Tn? So here's how we're going to do it. So suppose Tn equals, we know that, T of n minus 1 plus n minus 1. Now describe T of n minus 1 using the same formula. Think of this as, suppose I plug in n minus 1 for n. What will happen? I'm going to get T of n minus 2 plus n minus 2 to represent this part. And then in addition to that, I have an n minus 1 here. Now do the same thing with T of n minus 2. I will get T of n minus 3 plus n minus 3. And then we have from the previous term, n minus 2 and n minus 1. Now, if you continue to do this, you can say you're going to get at some point n minus n. You go 3, 2, and so on. If you get n minus n, you're going to get n minus n here. And the next one would be n minus n minus 1, and so on, up to n minus 2 and n minus 1. Now, if you think about this, this is t of 0, so that's the cost of selection sorting an array of size 0, which is 0, so we can say that's 0, and this number is 0, and this number happens to be 1, and you can imagine the next number has got to be 2, and so on, and then up to n minus 1 here. 
Now in order to find out what this equals to, recall that the sum of the first n terms is equal to n over 2 n plus 1. And if I replace the n by n minus 1, so if you ask the question, what is the sum of the first n minus 1 terms? Either you can subtract n from this or replace n here by n minus 1. So you get n minus 1 over 2 and then n minus 1 plus 1 would be n. So what you're going to get is the answer n minus 1 over 2 times n, which is a tilde 1 half n squared. So we proved that the selection sort is tilde 1 half n squared. All right, so let's take a look at the next problem. Uh, the next problem says that uh, given this word, uh, let's say a n a n d a. Uh, so let's sort this word using the insertion sort. The way the insertion sort work is that you assume that the first character, first entry of the array is sorted. Then you try to take the next one and try to insert it to the right place. So the next thing you're going to get is that n would be inserted after a. So you're going to get this. And the next step, you're going to take the next character and try to insert it into this array. So you only have to compare up to here because you're going to find out a is less than n, but a is equal to a, so you can insert that between a and a. So you're going to get this. And then you have this part that is not sorted. Now notice the invariant for insertion sort, and this area is now sorted. But this area is not. So the next step is to insert it here. Now in that case you only have to do one comparison and you figure out that n is greater than or equal to n. So therefore you don't have to move anything. You can just leave the n there. Now that's like a really nice case because you don't have to do anything. This character happens to be greater than anything on this array. So therefore no more comparisons necessary. You only need to do one comparison. Now let's do the next one. So we have DA here. The next time you're going to insert D, obviously D is going to come here. So you're going to have A, A, D, N, N, and then A here. So the final thing is that A is going to come here. So you're going to get A, 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 D, N, N. So that's the word sorted into its characters. Now if you think about this process, this process was really interesting. We always know that this part of the array is sorted. So this is sorted, 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 then finally the whole thing is sorted. So one of the things we always say about the insertion sort is that at any given stage, let's suppose you had the ith iteration we know the array segment from 0 to i minus 1. Assume that in this case i equals 1. The array segment from 0 to 0, which is this element here, is sorted. Now we call this an invariant. Invariant means that this is going to hold true throughout, the, uh, throughout this operation. Like for example, in this case i would be 2. So you're trying to insert the one with the second index. When you do that, we already know the array segment from 0 to 1, that's 2 minus 1, is sorted. So this is sorted. This is i equals 3. So 0 to 2 is sorted. 0 to 3 is sorted, and so on. So the key thing to notice here is that in the selection, in the insertion sort, one of the invariants is that at any given stage, this a 0 to i minus 1 is sorted. Now that kind of leads us nice into the next segment. The next segment is actually the code for selection sort. If you think about that, this is the i I was talking about. I'm going to start with i equals 1, the first index. We'll try to exchange. So that what this says is that if the a sub j is less than a sub j minus 1, that means if this n is less than that, then I'll have to exchange j and j minus 1. Obviously this doesn't happen here 
but it happens here. Notice that the a sub j, which is starting from j equals r2, right? so it's going to be less than n, see j minus 1, therefore I'm going to swap these two, and I'm going to get a a n. So that's what this procedure does. And then what we know is, at the end of this thing, we know that we have correctly inserted the ith element into the into the place. So here's how we want to think about it. Before we start this process here, the array segment from 0 to i minus 1 is sorted. So this is what we know. And then at this in this process, what we are trying to do is take the element a of i and exchange it, go through this loop, and keep exchanging until a of i fits into the right place. So that's why we say that once this is done, that we know that this segment, which is a of 0 to i, is sorted. So the question is asking that what can you conclude here? So when we enter, what did we know? We actually knew that this segment is sorted. So your assert statement should say something like this. The assert that this segment from a from 0 to i minus 1 is sorted. Now this is a really really cool way to think about this. Uh, this actually proves the correctness of the insertion sort. Because at the end of this thing, what do we know? We know that i is going to be n. So if this holds true, then we know that the whole array is going to be sorted because it'll go from i equals 1 to n minus 1. So this is the kind of thing that uh, you need to understand so that you understand the complexity or the correctness in this case, in fact, of insertion sort. All right, so let's take a look at this problem. What we have is a situation where we have a bunch of Bs, exactly n of them, and a bunch of As, n of them. We're asking the question, if you apply the insertion sort, uh, how many operations the array will do? In other words, how many compares it's going to do? So let's count like this. Uh, we're going to start the insertion sort from here. If you start with B, you're only going to do one comparison, and you figure out that the B is in the right place. So there'll be another one for this, and a finally another one for that. All right, so in this case, we have done now n minus 1 operations to know that all the Bs are in the right place. Now, if you take the next A, what's going to happen? I'm going to compare, compare, compare until here. So I'm going to get something like, when I insert it, I will have A here, then you'll have all the Bs here. So you have n b's here. In other words, I must have compared uh, n times to get to that. So I would have compared n times to get to that. So this a would require n operations to compare and get the a into the right place. What about the next one? The next one, if you compare, you have to compare to all these b's. So you compare 1, 2, 3, up to n. Plus you have to compare to a to know that you don't have to go anymore. So the A will go here, and all the Bs will come like this now. So these are the NBs. Uh, to get there, I had to do N comparisons with B, A and B, and then one more to know that I don't have to go anymore. This means I have to do N plus 1 comparisons. Now, if you make the same argument, you will realize that the next one also requires n plus 1, and if you continue to go, the final one will also require n plus 1. So this means that this is the cost of inserting the first a. These are the cost of inserting the other n minus 1 a's. So in total, we would have done n minus 1 plus n, and then you have n minus 1 of n plus 1, so that means n minus 1 times n plus 1, 
and we claim this is going to be n squared. So that's going to be the uh, complexity of sorting an array like this using uh, using insertion sort. All right, so let's take a look at uh, problem number two. Uh, this problem deals with a collection called bag. Uh, this one's going to be different from the bag.java in ALGS4, so don't get confused with the uh, two different implementations. Uh, but the whole idea here is that uh, you have a class, which is a collection, and in fact, if you go to the, uh, the precept page, you'll be able to see this bag.java code, and you can get a copy of this one if you like. So the question here is asking about iterators. One of the things you need to do for your assignment. So in other words, how do iterators work? This is a very impo important question. Now, some of the things about the iterators that you should know are, why do we need them? Well, we need them to allow clients to access a collection without knowing the underlying data representation. So a client doesn't have to know that the data is in stored in an array or in a linked list or some other data structure. So how do we define an iterator? The, to define an iterator means that each class that needs to implement an iterator must implement it. Like for example, here's the bag class. Bag class says it's a bag of items, which is a generic type, so I don't know whether it's a bag of anything. It says it can implement the iterable item. So in other words, it will provide, it's a promise, it's a contract. It says that I'm going to give you the iterator to go through this collection. So once you say you're going to implement iterable, what this means is that you must have a method called iterator. So iterator method returns a public iterator, which the user can, the client can use. Um, so the how do we do this so to do this uh, you can do several things like for example you can have a private class called reverse iterator you can do anything you want in other words the basic idea of iterator is to give the client a way to access the collection so you can access the collection using reverse order or the regular order or you can do a random order whatever you want to do is fine so in this case we define a private class called reverse iterator now the reverse iterator <coughs> implements the iterator interface. So the question is, how do we write the methods? For example, how do we write the constructor for this private class? And two other important methods like has next and next, which are very important things. And the, uh, the way this reverse iterator is accessed by the client is through this public method called iterator. And the reverse iterator, notice that we are creating a new reverse iterator object to send it to the, to the client. So we'll get to the client side a little bit later. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention is that remove is generally not implemented because it can be dangerous. Okay, so let's go back to, to the uh, slides and think about what we are trying to do with an iterator. So let's think about this a little bit. Okay, so the goal here is that you have to fill in this, these fields. So the question is, how do I think about an iterator? Now, if you think about the my bag, my bag has, is implemented using an array. So what I will do is I'll think about this as an array is the one that implements, it's a collection, it's the container for the collection. So in order to access this collection from the reverse order, so if you have something here, two, one, five, three, two, one, the reverse order would be one, two, three, five, one, two. Now in order to access it, I need some sort of a pointer. I'm gonna call this i. So I'm gonna write a pointer here. I need a pointer int i int i. So notice that the i is, I'm going to initialize the i to n. The reason I do that, I don't want to initialize the i to n minus 1 uh, because n minus 1 may not exist. Like for example, if n equals 0, n minus 1 would be negative 1. So I don't want to deal with i equals negative 1. 
So I'm going to start with i equals n. So that's going to be my uh, my uh, constructor. So the constructor will say, let i be n. Now note that the n is the size of the class. So for example, this would be uh, the size. If you look at the index, uh, it would be the size. Okay, so that how much, how many elements do I have in the iterator? So the i would be equal to size. So you can call it n if n equals size. Has next. What does that mean? Has next means I look ahead and see if there's something there. So the way I think about that is saying, all right, so has next means that I want to return i greater than zero. Why did I say this? So in other words, as long as i is greater than zero, so for example, the final i for me would be one here. So I look ahead and say, oh, there's another one next to this. So, so when I see it, I'm going to look here and say, okay, there's another one. I can return that. Now, once again, notice that this is a very good condition, not i greater than or equal to zero. The i is strictly greater than zero. So, for example, if n, because we, we know we are starting from i equals n, if n happens to be zero and the i greater than n, i greater than zero is false. All right, because i would be then zero. If i equals n and n is zero, then this is false. So this means has next return false. That's what you want. If you have an empty collection, you don't have anything to return. Now the next will return an item because we are dealing with the generic class. So it will return an item. Now how do we return the item? To return the item, I need to take the pointer and what, take the one before that. So this means I have to return a of minus minus i. Minus minus i means that I want to decrement i by 1 and then return. So keep in mind that minus minus i means the same as decrementing the i first and then accessing a of i. Now that's what I want to do. So if you do that, I think it's going to be it's going to be great, right? So it's going to be fine because you will have a, the final i when i equals greater than zero. If you say if you have next, take a look at the i equals one, you have next, and then you decrement i, you get to zero, you return it. So finally, i will become zero. At that point, this will return false. Okay, so our method correctly works on what we are trying to do. So the next problem is asking us to uh, tell us the, to look at the code and see what the output is going to be. Uh, what you have here is that adding three things to the bag object, a bag of integers, and then iterating to, using this special symbol as for each i in my bag or, or for each j in my bag, print out i and j. Now what this is going to do is to use the iterator for my bag and define the order of i and j based on that. Now to understand that, let's go back to the code. So in the code, you can look at the my bag. In the my bag, what we're doing is whenever we add an item, we add it to the end and then increment by one. Now, uh, so how do we how do we think about the? So in this case, I have added uh, the integers from one to n, whatever that n is. All right, so if I give uh, n equals uh, n equals 1, n equals 3, you would add first 1, then 2, and then 3. So if you have a reverse iterator, it's going to print out 3, 2, 1. Now, let's see the impact of what we are thinking right here. Suppose I write that statement, i in my bag, notice that my bag is the object, my bag, And then I'm going to say standard out dot print line print line uh, i. All right, see what happens. Okay, so I'm going to compile this, and hopefully it'll compile fine. And once I compile, yep, it's fine. There are a bunch of warnings, but I will ignore them for now. And then I'm going to just run the Java bag with three. 
So notice that it gave me the elements in the reverse order. The reason it gave me the elements in the reverse order is that my iterator is the reverse iterator. So if I change this to a random iterator and implement a class called random iterator class, you'll be able to print them out in some random order. Now the question we want to ask is that, is there another way to understand this, what we just did? This is the Java shortcut for using iterators. But I can also use the fundamental idea of iterators. In other words, uh, iterator is something, an object that I want to use. So let's suppose that I define an iterator of integer type, and I will call this iterator one. And then iterators are really public methods that can be used when you have a class. Like for example, if you have a my bag object, then I can use this iterator method, which is a public method. So the way I do that is to say, okay, it's gonna be my bag, that's the name of the object, and the iterator method, iterator here. All right, so the to get the same output as we get from here, I'm gonna write this as while iterator one dot has next. And then I'm gonna say standard out dot print line um, iterator one iterator one dot next. That's it. So I'm gonna claim that this input, this output, this code, and this code will give you the same thing. So let's uh, try to see if that's the case. So we got that, and now I'm going to I'm going to run this again and claim that this piece of code and this piece of code will give me the same thing. So let's do the same thing, Java bag three. So notice that first piece of code gave me 210, and then it gave me 210 again from this piece of code. So this means the same, they are the same code. Now in order to understand how uh, the question is, working so we are asking if you have an independent iterator i and an independent iterator j and what is going to happen when you do this so in other words you can think of this as i starting with 2 because it's a reverse iterator and then j going from 2 1 3 so you can imagine that the output coming from this piece of code is going to be uh, so let me give this yeah so it's going to be the, let's get the ink color going here. So it, it would be 2 is the i, and then 2, 1, 3 is the reverse order. Then after that, it's going to get 1 as the i, and 2, 1, 3, and then it's going to take 3, and 2, 1, 3. So finally, uh, to see, uh, it's, it's, it's asking us to uh, to think about this and see if we can write this in a different way. So I will take you back to what we did with a single loop. So here's the single loop that print out the numbers in the reverse order because iterator is the reverse iterator. And here's the, the code that is equal to this code. It's the same impact as that code if you write this code. Now, so what we're going to do is we're going to, instead of using i and j and some shorthand code, we're just going to use the fundamentals of iterators. So I need iterator 1, which is the i iterator. So I create a new iterator. And then while iterator 1 has next, so it'll start with the last one, which is 2, take the iterator uh, once next. Let's say the first one, it gets it 2. And then create a new iterator to go through the the list again. So these are two independent iterators, iterator 1 and iterator 2. So while the iterator 2 has next, print out the iterator 1 next. Actually this should be called next one, which is very important. So the next one is sort of like the fixed i, fix the i, and then take the next uh, one from the iterator 2. So in other words, the first one, this the, the iterator 1 gets the 2 first. And then it'll go through, you know, whatever, two, one, three, right? 
So let's see how this works. And uh, if it works correctly, this and this will give you the same output. So let's compile it and run it for with the Java bag three. Okay, so let's take a look at this. Now the first set of outputs are coming from these outputs are coming from the INJ, this loop here. And the next set of outputs are coming from the sort of the fundamental iterator code. So notice that these this output is similar to the output we got before. So this proves that we can use the iterator on its own uh, using the fundamental idea of iterators or we can use this Java shortcut to make things clear and more easy to write. So that's the uh, sort of the answer to, to C. Uh, we can convert this code to this code. So finally, let's think about the, uh, the memory requirement. So any advantage to using increments by 10 instead of doubling? Now, we can make an argument. We know that doubling is a good method because we can get a mortise cost to be big O of 1. But uh, what if you do increments by 10? Is there a memory advantage? Um, so to answer that question, let's suppose if your array has n element, you are really, and the, the array is full, you're using 8 n bytes of memory. This is the minimum requirement for the array given these given you have n things now if the array is 20 less than full 20 less than full then the array will be reduced by 10 so we couldn't have the worst case scenario would be that you have 20 less than full so the array will have 8 n plus the uh, 8 times 10 memory that's the uh, the maximum requirement for an array of size n so in other words if you have 20 less and you go down by 10 and that means you're going to have 10 empty spaces so therefore max requirement for the array is this now if you recall the max requirement for doubling would be 32 n can look at the lecture slides to understand that so certainly there is an advantage to increments by 10 in terms of memory but in terms of average cost it's still going to be big O of n which may not be ideal situation so finally this problem the amortized analysis it's the bonus question uh, so the question is that you have a resizing array of a stack that increases in size by 10 when the array is full. So in other words, if you have an array, suddenly it becomes full, array of n things, and then you increase it by size 10. So you can write 10 more elements. Or you decrease in size by 10 if the array has 20 or more empty spaces. So let's assume that you had n things and then you start deleting things and then you had uh, 20 or more empty spaces, empty 10, 10 here. So at this point you would create a new array that has just 10 more than the size so you can keep writing. So the question is that what's the best case cost of push? and pop operations. So the best case is that you have spaces to write. So you have empty spaces. So the push would be O of 1 and pop would be O of 1. In other words, you can pop, it doesn't shrink like this case. So these are, this can happen when you pop, you can go from 20 empty spaces to 10 empty spaces. But the best case is O of 1. The worst case a push is that when you uh, when you have to push you don't have enough space so you have to recreate another array of size n plus 10 and then you have to write all these n elements from the old array to the new one 
So the worst case of push is O of M. Worst case of pop is that you start popping elements and at some point you only you get to this situation where you have, you have 20 or more spaces and then you have to resize it. So in that case, the pop will also cost big O of N. The other question is, what's the amortized cost of push and pop operations? So, um, so let's think about this. This means that if you do N operations of push, or n operations of pop, what would be the average cost of doing this? Um, so to think about this, so let me find some space here. So if to write n things, obviously it's going to cost, you know, n operations to write if you just have an array of, you know, empty array of n things, you can just write them into that so that's in operations but if you have to every time you write so let's suppose you start with site 0 and then you have to make it 10 you have to make it 20 you have to make it 30 so this means that the array will be resized n over 10 times let's assume that for simplicity n is a multiple of 10 so n over 10 times at a cost this is the resize cost at a cost so the first time you resize it, you have to do 10 operations, but you have to do two times 10 operations because you have to read from the old one and write to the new one. So you're copying an array of size 10 from the old one to the new one. So you've got to do that. Now you have, to, you have an array of size 20, but you have to copy 10 of them from the old one. The next time you have to resize, now the two times once again is you have to read and write. So that's two operations per uh, resizing per element. The next time you have to resize is 20, right? So you have to write 20. Now it has become 30. So you got 10 more places. So at some point, uh, you could, like I said before, the, this is going to be, you're going to be resizing this n over 10 times. But every time you're going to add 10 extra places. So if you think about the sum of these things, this is just like a regular sum of 10, 20, up to n. And uh, it's not hard to see that this is of big O of n squared. So in other words, in order to resize, it's going to cost you big O of n squared to resize as you put n elements into it. So therefore, the average cost or the amortized cost is going to be n squared divided by n, that would be n. So the average cost of push and pop operation is going to be big O of n, and pop, you can argue the same way, it's going to be big O of n. Now, uh, the next question says, give a sequence of push and pop operation that can result in the worst case performance. So if you think of a sequence like this, suppose you do 20 push operations um, and let's say you start you have an array of size 20 it doesn't matter what wherever you want to start is fine once you do 20 then you have to resize so it's a you have to resize this to be a 31 and then suppose after that you do a 10 pop and the uh, now you may have to resize so you do 20 push uh, and 10 pop and then you can do 20 push again and 10 pop the sequence such as that can uh, can provide this kind of bad behavior uh, so it's push and pop push and pop but it, if you recall the uh, this is very similar to an array you're increasing an array by size 1 whenever you push something and then you decrease by size 1 when you pop something so in a situation like that, if you keep doing push and pop alternatively, uh, you're going to run into this worst case behavior. One thing that's interesting is that, is there an advantage to using increments by 10 instead of doubling? We know that doubling gives us the best performance. 
With doubling, we can get this amortized cost to be big O of 1. That's great. But then why would you even do this? So I think one of the arguments you can make is that in doubling, you're going to have a lot of space that may not be used. So you're going to use a lot of space. So the, the advantage of doing something like this, suppose, so let me solve it here. Suppose the array has n elements and oops, 